All right, everyone, I want to thank you for tuning into our first webinar. I know this is the third in a three-part series that uh, Maggie, Lindsay, and Kelly were a part of. And so, uh, but this is our first time doing this. Uh, so R as in Katie over here. So we're, uh, uh, I think I've things worked out so far and everything should flow pretty smoothly. Kid is over in the corner watching the show. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but really want to thank you for tuning in and watching this. It will get this and the others up on our YouTube channel. And that was a question that came in. So we'll make sure that those are available. We put a lot of work into them. So we definitely want to make sure everybody's got those for future reference. We'll get those up. Uh, I want to direct you real quick. Uh, I, I know many folks don't have Facebook, uh, but we do have this posted here. This is our March program schedule. So if you're in the Rapid City area or within a short drive of here, here's some of the programs we got coming up. Some family archery. Uh, our next webinar that we're gonna be doing is a shed hunting webinar. Uh, that will we'll post some information on how to get signed up for that. Uh, there's date night archery. Uh, we've got a hunt safe program going so we can I know it's still a lot of online stuff, but we want to make sure that uh, people can get the in-person portion of that training if you would, would like to get your hunt safe card. Uh, girls night gun safety, that's just handling firearms, uh, our inert firearms from our hunt safe, just to get uh, familiar with those sorts of things. And then our family knot tying, family intro to fishing, and then group programs there. And any questions on those, there's an email down there at the bottom, tocwest at state.sd.us. So you can go ahead and Send a question to that. Be uh, patient with us. We've got a new registration coming that should really help registrate, registering for these programs quite a bit easier. Uh, so we, uh, a couple other things uh, before we get started. I want to give you kind of the overview of what we're doing with this webinar, the topics we're going to hit. Since this is the third of the three-part series, we really wanted to hit some more advanced level tactics. And in the process, I learned a lot. It was, it was really fun chatting with some of these experts in the field and what they do, those folks that really do a lot of ice fishing. And we, uh, I did the shelter part. So we've got some things on some shelters. We've got some tactics for targeting specific fish species, uh, which I love that section. And then some use of technology on the ice, which is, just makes ice fishing really fun. Uh, this is not a sales pitch for any sort of gear at all. It's just uh, we want to just show what's out there and show what's available. Uh, it just is there to help supplement your experience, to help you catch more fish, uh, to have more fun, stay warmer, that sort of thing. So we have two guest speakers. We have Scott Olson, a community member and a volunteer here at the Outdoor Campus, as well as John Herrero, uh, fisheries biologist here at the Outdoor Campus as well. So. Uh, if you have questions, leave them in the, uh, the Q&A uh, so that everybody can see those as well. And we can uh, uh, answer those as we go. If, if it's a good time to pause, I'll, I'll answer those if, if I can. Uh, otherwise, we'll leave a spot at the end to do a little Q&A. So let's get rolling with this. We did pre-record uh, some of these things, so it's not just me here in the classroom doing a little webinar. We've got some good video uh, that we're going to be sharing with you. That uh, is right here. So the first First little thing we had in our webinar that we wanted to hit was just some of our shelters that you can really use to make your experience a lot better. And I'm gonna pause this as I kind of work my way through it. Uh, we set these up just in the classroom because it was really cold when we did this, if you all know, uh, as you all know. Uh, but ice shelters are not a required thing, definitely to be fishing, but almost <laughs> as a South Dakota ice fisherman in really cold weather. Uh, there's two different styles here that we're going to have. And this first one is a hub style or a pop-up of some sort that is kind of like an, the hunting blind style. And this is a very large hub. I found the best way to open these up is to kind of lay it out, spread out those, those legs, and then go around the edge, pop and open the sides, and then working your way on the inside. Uh, 
we did have a little issue with this particular one and it has to do with the order at which you pop these up and put it away. So make sure that you do that in the reverse order and everything should be pretty good. So the second method is a more sled style that allows you to be quite a bit more mobile. Um, you can see on the previous, previous method, you pop that up, you can have a really large group. Uh, they're pretty cost effective for as many people as you can put in those hub style ones, uh, but you're not as mobile. This one is on a sled. So you're able to pop this thing up. And if you aren't catching any fish, you can throw it back down and move your sled along to a next spot and you're pretty mobile. And both of these stay pretty warm. The first one's got a little bit more installation to them, uh, but you're gonna have less people in this one. The hub style is one you're definitely gonna wanna stake down as we noticed once as the wind picked up one day out on the ice and that shelter went a flying. So you really wanna make sure you're staking those down and uh, making sure that they're secure. This one, as long as your butt's in the seat, shouldn't go too terrible far. Pretty comfortable, nice seat in there. You're definitely only gonna have two people in this one. They make three person ones as well uh, and more. So you can, you can get some, uh, uh, various options and, and styles in those, but a little bit more, more money in those. An economy, an economy version of that, you could even use your hunting blind if you really had to and you don't do a lot of ice fishing. Uh, it might be something at least to get the wind off of you. Uh, I've definitely seen guys sitting behind their vehicles just trying to get the wind off of you if, you're, if it's safe enough to drive your vehicle out on the ice. So this next individual we had was uh, Scott Olson. He uh, goes by the, the name Dr. Auger as a, uh, a part of his social media platform that he holds. So we've got some very good advanced ice fishing tactics with him. So we'll play this and enjoy that, what he has to say. Hello, my name is Scott Olson. I'm a local resident here in the Black Hills. I live in Rapid City. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'd be a, what I would call a professional ice fisherman. I'm with, I'm with several different companies in the industry, including Clam and Vexilar. Um, and here, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, rod selection when it comes to different kinds of panfish, uh, walleye, trout, uh, and pike here in the hills. What you're going to target will depend on what will determine what kind of rod you would want to pick. So if you're going after, say, uh, you know, panfish or perch here in the hills, you were looking at uh, ultralight to light action rods, such as these ones here. Um, they are, you can tell in a light action rod because they're going to they're be really wobbly in the tip. They're going to have a lot of bend. So these rods, you're going to use this to see, you'll see the bites a lot of, really easy with these ones, especially for those light biting perch and bluegills around here. Um, and they are actually a lot of fun with, with hard fighting trout as well. If you ever caught a decent sized trout on one of these things, I mean, these things are going to really bend a lot. Um, there are different types of ultralights. You've got just your standard ultralight, where you just have that full bend in the rod like this. You've got some ultralights or light actions where I would call, they're called noodle tips, where the action is all on the tip. You can kind of see how that bends like this. You're going to see those, this, this, this picks up those bites extremely well, and then it goes into backbone, just like that. So these kind of rods are really nice. Um, these are my favorite kind of style of rod for most of the panfish and trout around here because you're going to see those on those, on those hard bite days, you're going to see, you're going to see that tip moving a lot with those bites, but you've got a lot of backbone to handle larger fish should you, which a lot of our hills, lakes around here have got bigger fish and they're like pike and bass and the uh, and lake trout. We keep walking on down the line here. Uh, this is a meat stick rod, which is a really popular rod here in the hills. It's kind of probably your, one of your best overall round rods just because of what it does and what it features. This one has a sanded glass tip here in the front, so it's basically like a noodle tip, but it's got, it's, a, it's classified as a medium rod, so it's got a lot of backbone. So this rod can handle anything from little, from, from, your little, from your little bluegills all the way up to full-scale walleyes or even lake tribes. Seen some guys catch lakers on these rods as well. Probably just a good classic all-around rod for here. Something that has the noodle tip with that large that amount of backbone in there. Now a lot of times for your trout around here, I like to go either light or medium light actions because there are some some of the bigger fish you can get a little bit better control 
over the bigger fish with a medium light rod as opposed to a light, an ultra light or a light action rod. So if your, your classification of a ultra of a medium light means you've got still got that bend in the tip, but you've got they see this, it's not a full bend in the rod like it was with those like it was with those ultra lights and lights, but it's got a lot of backbone. Really good for really good for those hard fighting trout around here in the hills, and even some of your wall even some of your walleyes can be caught with these medium lights pretty easily. And you get up to like your walleye and your pike, your walleye, your lake trout, your pike size rods, you're looking at definitely medium actions and probably closer to medium heavies if you're going after if you're going after lake trout and pike. Um, and just so you know, with a medium action rod, you're looking at you know it's a little bit stiffer, but you've still got that you still got some bend in the rod. But you can see where the bend is at here. You get a, you get a lot more a lot more control, a lot more hook setting power with these ones to get that get those hooks into those bigger fish when you're setting the hook. And all the way up to your like this is a this would be a this is a medium action rod here. You can see that bend there. And then you get up to like then you get up to your medium heavies. This is my rod I use mostly for uh, lake trout or bigger walleye action, some pike action. But you can see you've got a lot you got some tip into them and you got a lot of backbone. So you can you can really hand it can handle the hard, those hard head those hard head um, shakes of those bigger of those bigger fish. So I mean I've caught I've caught fish on all on layer stuff too, but you know it's a uh, you're always a little nervous when you catch a bigger fish on something light, on some of these light, on some of these lighter things. So it's good to know what kind of rod you're looking at, uh, as long as you know what kind of fish you're going to go for. Be it your your bluegills, your pan, your bluegills, your crappie, your trout, your walleye, your pike. Always look at what the action of the rod is to determine what kind of rod you should get to grab for this particular kind of fish. When you're targeting those particular kind of, of game fish around here, be it your bluegills, perch, walleye, trout, pike, and, and lake trout action, you also want to base your tackle on what you're also going to be targeting. Now, if you're going for, say, bluegills, you're not going to be using big spoons, big jigs for bluegills because they aren't that big after all. You'll be looking at more smaller type jigs. Sizes that are you know uh, thirty second ounce or less, or in term you know when you come when it comes to tungsten jigs like most of the, like most of these jigs are, you've got threes and three millimeter and four millimeter size. So you got different colors. I mean, uh, conditions will det determine what kind of colors you can use. On a on an overcast day, you're looking at either like golds or the uh, or really bright colors because the fish need to be, are going to see this are going to see these particular kind of bright colors from further away as opposed to something that's clear and doesn't have a lot doesn't have a lot of color to it. Um, if you're going for like you know for for uh, like trout around here, you're looking you're you're gonna, up, you're gonna upstep your lures a bit. You're gonna go for bigger hooks because we're you're fishing for a bigger fish after all. So you got like your fours and sometimes your five millimeters, like these ones are, or is, or you can even call it like a, a core up to about an eighth ounce jig. And you've got different colors, different style, different styles. Um, it just kind of depends on the you know, condition of the fish. The more the more colors you have, the more colors you can try to figure out what those fish are going after. Now, when it comes to spoons, that I mean for, for jigs, you, get, you can have a large, large or the wide assortment from just your standard teardrops to your, your more extravagant ones, like you've got uh, like caviar drops that may look like fish eggs, uh, lures, that, you know, jigs that have got a lot of colors and little little crystals in them to kind of ref reflect and refract light a lot better to retract fish from further distances. All the way down to your teeny tiny little jigs that are for those really hard for those really hard bite days, where you've got where you got to go, you got to downsize and just put on a little bit of like your maggots or wax worms just to get those fish to bite. Now, for as far as your spoon actions, you've got you got to also go with your with your sizes for spoons. What you're fishing, what you're fishing for? Now, a lot of times these smaller spoons like these ones here, these are definitely more your panfish and your trout. Um, they're just a variety of colors, they have a variety of different features they do. Some of these rattle, a lot of these just flash um, because you're trying to attract attention, you're trying to attract the fish's attention from a long ways away to bring them in. So it also depends on you know, water clarity and the conditions outside as well, like, just like you with jigs. Sometimes these are actually good at bringing in fish and they may not want to bite these. So what you do is you'll use these to bring attract the fish, but they don't want to bite. Then you'll downsize and go back to your jigs. So it's always important to keep a couple of rods handy, one with a spoon, one with a jig, so you're ready to go for whatever the conditions those fish determine that they want to go for. Now, if you're a larger fish, like your pike, your walleye, your lake trout, you're going to upsize, of course, to bigger spoons. I'm a, bit, I'm a big spoon guy when it comes to those larger predator fish. Uh, for like your lake trout and like pactola, you're using spoons that flash a lot. Spoons that can, because that, that water is so clear in pactola, you're going to want these fish, these fish can see these, fla these flashing lures from a long ways away. 
This in particular one is a flutter spoon, so when it's falling, it's just gonna it's gonna it's just gonna move back and forth, back and forth in the water column, and really flash those colors out there to try to attract the fish in. Now there are some lures that are gonna have like rattles in them. Um, those ones are good just because uh, fish can can hear noise underwater quite a ways away. Um, but for the most part, when it comes to for me for the fishing that I do, I like to, I like spoons. I like a little bit of flash. I like to be able to attract the fish in. Um, you know, sometimes some of your flashy spoons have got little beads in them too. Like this particular one here has got some beads in it, so it'll have the flash, but it'll also have a bead action to bring in the fish as well with the auditory line. So, and I like to put, usually I put like a minnow head on these, on these spoons, uh, something that brings the fish in. And then, you know, you got the attraction, and you got the scent of the, scent of the, of the bait on there to bring them in as well. So I'm a, I'm a big plastics user when it comes to panfish and trout, but for the larger predator fish, I do like to I do like to use uh, minnow heads or something with some with some scent on it so that you not only get the the visual cue from the fish with the with the bigger spoons but then once they get closer they've also got that scent uh, to bring them in as well. And a lot of times with when it comes to those bigger predator fish too, I like to run a dead stick setup where it's just either uh, just your, you know just a hook and a bo hook and a minnow attached to it um, with either a bobber or if you use tip ups or like Arctic Warrior setups. Um, for which are just you know the rods on rods on a holder tip goes down flag goes up you come you grab the rod and reel it in. Um, I like to use those for when I fish for bigger trout anything from bigger trout on up through pike and lake trout because sometimes the fish are going to be lethargic they'll come in to see what you're what you're jigging and what's making all the commotion in front of them but they're not necessarily going to bite that. But if you have a minnow nearby or a shiner or something that's got you know something that's moving they'll, they'll often be attracted to that and uh, instead they'll go and bite that instead of your lure because the minnow is just moving back and forth you know slowly around where it's, it's so they, it's an easy meal for them to come and get and they're not feeling really aggressive um so your you know so your basic setup would be you know keep it keeping some tip-ups or some dead sticks nearby with bobbers or minnows on and then you're going to be sitting your one hole jigging you know jigging your rod either with you know if you're going for go for trout you'll be jigging your bigger jigs your spoons and you have, minnow, you have your minnows nearby for those fish to go after if they don't want to go after your, your aggressive presentation with your lure. Um, tip, I don't usually use a lot of uh, dead sticks for my panfish setups, but there are some guys who do. You can kind of see where the schools are at. If you use little, tiny, little tiny jigs or little tiny hooks, you know, if you throw in a bunch of wax worms or some maggots onto it, you can kind of see sometimes where the schools are at, where they're, when they're running through if they don't want to go after your, go after your, your little jig or your, spoon, your little spoon. All right, so when it comes to different places to look for on a lake, when you're, if you're going to go for the fish, if you don't have a lake map handy, you can look for different features kind of on the lake to kind of determine where you might want to go. Um, now, there are, there are different, there are lake maps available online for free. The Game of Fish website actually has a good assortment of different contoured lakes. You can print them off for free. You can use those as kind of a guide to kind of show you spots on these different lakes around the hills here where you can look for fish. But if you don't have those, what you're going to look for on most lakes, you're going to look for different points where the, you know, it comes out a little ways, comes back in. Those are always good places to check out because you're going to have shallow to deep water transition points and the fish tend to hang around on those transition areas where it goes from shallow to deep in a hurry. That can, that's to deal with, with bluegills and perch all the way up to walleyes and uh, pike. Pike are more of a shallow fish, but they will tend to, they will hang around those, if there's weeds in the area, they'll hang around those weeds where it transitions from weeds to deeper water a lot of times. Um, also back in bays. Bays are a good place to find uh, panfish a lot of times. If you go anywhere around here, like say if you go to uh, Deerfield or Stockade, there are plenty of bays around in there. You're going to find, that's a lot of times where you're going to find where the bluegills are hanging out, where the trout are hanging out, because there's the, the, the bays tend to be more gentle sloping in nature. They don't dive as deep, but they'll have, but they tend to have a lot more weeds in them too than the points do. So as long as the weeds are nice, as long as it's, as long as the weeds are still around, and you can use that spot. You drill the hole, you can look down the hole, the water's clear, you'll be able to see. But if you have a if you have a vex if you have a vexilar or any other kind of flasher, you'll be able to tell that on the screen as well, just by the amount of green that's on your screen as opposed to the hard red line. Um, but yeah, bays and points are your two are your two big areas to look for on a lake when you're going someplace to try and find pretty much any fish, especially panfish or walleyes. Um, your trout tend to be roamers more than anything else, your, especially for your rainbow trout around here. Um, you can probably pretty much pick any kind of bay or any area where you've got a, a gentle transition of the depth 
and there'll be a good chance of, 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 a, of trout coming through. That goes for like Deerfield, that goes for Pactola, that goes for any of the smaller trout lakes around here, like Sylvan, Mitchell, Center Lake. Um, they're just going to keep roaming around. They don't really key on any particular kind of feature. They're just a roaming fish, as opposed to your panfish, which, which like to hang around weeds and moss in the water, and your walleyes, which favor kind of a more of a gravelly bottom. They like to hang around those transitions where it goes from shallow to deep uh, in a hurry. If you go to like Angostura or Orman, there's, plenty, there's a lot of points there, and a lot of guys are always fishing around those points because that's where the water goes from the shallow deep in a hurry, and those fish are hanging around in those transition areas along those points. Uh, for pike action, you're going to be looking more at shallow, shallow weedy areas. I like to look for cattails that are hanging out in these lakes because it usually means it's shallow and it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of weeds going further out as well. So if you can find cattails, it's a good chance you could sit in it's a lake that has pike in it, like Stockade or uh, Pactola around here. Um, you can set up your tip-ups anywhere from, you know, three feet deep all the way out to about 10 feet. I've never caught pike in deeper than 10 feet, although some guys have. Um, but for my tip-ups, they're going to have either a shiner on them or a frozen piece of smelt. That's where you're going to put your tip-ups at, is along those, just look at those cattails, find the weed areas along there, set your tip-ups along there. Well, when it comes to, uh, you know, in the middle of the winter, like we're, like we're in now, um, your panfish are not going to really be in the shallow waters anymore. The plant, I mean, with all the snow on top of the ice now, there's no sunlight getting down to the weeds that are below the ice, so the weeds are all dying. So they're gonna, there's not a lot of oxygen, not a lot of food for them now. So for most of your panfish, you're going to be looking at deeper than 10 feet now to find your panfish, especially perch. Perch are going to be 20 feet or more. Um, if you go to Sheridan right now, you're looking probably about 30 feet or deeper to find most of your schools of perch. Um, because it's there's more there's more there's more plant life out there. There's more everything is transitioned down to deeper water. Trout are still going to be wandering around no matter what is around. They're just opportunistic feeders, and they're just going to be roaming. Uh, your walleyes will tend to follow transition from the they'll come up into the shallower water in the early early morning, like around sunrise, uh, following the schools of bait, and then they'll and they'll, they'll slide back into the deeper water over ten you know probably well over twenty feet deep. In the after after the morning, and then in come to come the evening, about that half hour before sunset, they'll start. They'll fire, and they're gonna fall, the bait fish come up again into the shallow water, so the walleyes will slide up further in there too. Uh, your northerns tend to be tend to hang out, looking for about you know they're like trout. They're up, they're just gonna eat whatever they can whatever they can find. They're more of a shallow water fish. Um, you know you can catch some deeper water, but for the most part, if you're targeting pike, you're gonna be looking at less than 10 feet of water. And we in weeds and cattails. That's like I said, it's my areas the key would be those areas right there for pike lake trout you know they they tend they're deep water fish regardless of the season you're going to find them i think they're right now they're in 60 to 100 feet of water uh you just want to look for uh steep you know like like walleyes look for those steep drops uh look off the off the points um and set up baits and you know you, you want to set up your tip ups and either you know varying depths to kind of see where the fish might be coming through and while you're sitting there jigging another rod remember in south dakota we can have up to four rods during ice season per person. So if you're out, one rod's for jigging, got three, rod, three rods or tip ups out for the dead sticks if you're going for any of the bigger predator fish around here. You can maximize your amount of, your, your depths you're covering and maybe find out where the fish you're at by using the by using, using dead, stick, dead sticks or tip ups as well as your jigging rods. When, when you're looking at uh, target, whatever fish you're gonna be going after and you're looking for those weed lines, you're going to need to use your, your Vexlar or your other flash you have to find them if you don't have an underwater camera or have a lake map handy. Um, weeds will show up tip, typically if they're, if they're taller weeds and you put your transistor down into the hole, you're going to see green up higher and then you're going to see your hard red bottom. Um, that tells you that there are weeds around that area and you're going to fish above those weeds depending on what you're fishing for. If it's panfish, you're looking at about six inches to a foot above the weeds. Uh, for bigger for bigger predators, if it were say you know bigger trout or walleyes, probably a foot above that because you're trying to get their attract you're trying to attract them in. Now, if you have a softer bottom that has just like moss or even just mud, it's going to show up. You might it'll show up as either hard red line on the bottom screen on the bottom when on your flasher screen, or you're going to see a little thin line of green sometimes well, right right before you hit right before you hit that red mark the the red the red bottom on your on your flasher screen. Um, that's typically what you're going to use to find if you don't have an underwater camera or any other way to really see down there is to use, use your Vexlar or use your other flashers um, to be able to tell where the weeds are. You can just you put your transistor down, you'll you can tell right away if there are weeds within that cone angle of your area based on how based on where those green marks show up in relation to the bot to the bottom mark. Well, 
uh, right now, because of because of where we're at in the winter time here, um, you're going to be looking for early morning, like you know, before, right before sunset, to start fishing, or right in that last you know half hour of daylight. The day. Those are those are those are your best fishing windows at this time of year, in February into March here. Um, and typically, early ice season, you can fish pretty much any time in the morning. Um, then the bite kind of dies off in the afternoon as the fish kind of go deeper. And then right around, you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon or so, they start pushing back into the shallows to feed again. Uh, right now, with the way um, with the way the winter is, you've got that about an hour, hour and a half window right away in the morning, right about sunrise, where the fishing usually can be really good if you can, if you can get on the fish. And you've got that last half an hour, 45 minutes of daylight in the evenings, especially for walleye fishing this time, this time of year. Early, early morning walleye fishing right before dark. Your, that's your two best windows for walleye fishing right now. As far as with your panfish, you're looking about, you're talking about the same. The same windows are those early mornings or right before dark. Uh, trout, as, they are, as, they are, as the roamers, you can usually catch them kind of throughout the day. Best luck I've usually had is in the morning before 10 o'clock, and then after that, they kind of, it kind of dies down. The fish move away, they scatter, they go deeper. And then right around 2 o'clock in the afternoon or so, it's usually a little easier to, to find them. And at least at least have them roam, roaming through your area again because they're actively they're actively feeding again in the afternoon. So kind of that you know 10, 10 to two window, you might you know that's, that's you can kind of relax. You can put out tip ups to see if there's anything out if you haven't already done already. Have some lunch, um, but uh, typically your best fishing is to be early morning and right before dark. You know, when it comes to any kind of fishing you're doing in the hills, be it for perch, bluegills, walleye, lake trout, pike, it's always important to have the right kind of gear for targeting those fish. Now you can catch, a, you can catch, you know, really big fish on little tiny lures. Um, you can catch, on occasion you'll catch some really, some, some really good sized fish on some bigger spoons. Um, it just kind of depends on how, how aggressive the fish are feeding. But typically, if you, whatever fish you're going to target, you want to gear your gear, or you want to put your gear towards that particular fish. If it's bluegills, Little jigs, little spoons. Trout, you know, slightly bigger jigs, slightly bigger spoons. Walleyes, pike, lake trout, bigger spoons have a lot of flash, make a lot of noise. You want to be able to call those. You want to be able to call those fish in. Um, the water conditions can determine what lures you use. Be if it's if it's if it's really clear water, nice bright lures. If it's cloudy water, or overcast like it is today, a lot of a lot of bright colors, as opposed to more of those clear colors like gold and silver, blue, what have you. Um, so you want to make sure you're kind of gearing your gear towards the fish you're going to be going after. It also applies with your rods. You're not going to use, you're not going to use, you know, a medium heavy rod to, for, to, go, to go after bluegills here, or even, or even, or even, this, even, even regular trout. You're going to want to have a lure that's going to be, you know, a rod that's going to be able to show those bites of those light biting fish, but also be able to handle the bigger fish that come by and sometimes grab these lures. So whether it's an ultralight action, a light action rod like these ones, to your medium, medium heavies like this, the fish you're, the fish you're going to go after to determine what kind of gear you're going to buy from those fish. All right. So thanks again for being patient with our audio. Again, first time doing our webinar, and uh, um, we'll deal with it. But... Uh, and also alarm going off in the building, uh, changing a diaper over there. So we're nailing it. And uh, had a uh, couple of questions come in. I do want to hit those uh, at the end. So there's some good stuff there. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I won't hold this up too terrible much in here. We have uh, John Carrero now on some advanced ice fishing techniques. Again, keep those questions coming in if you got them. And I'd love to, to do my best to answer those in the end here. So, thanks. To determine what kind of gear you're gonna buy for those fish. I'm John Carreau with Game Fishing Parks. Just want to visit today with you guys about some uh, ice fishing sonars or fish finders, which really help you locate fish on a, on a lake. Um, are they needed to catch fish? Absolutely not. But the thing is, if you have a hand auger and you're drilling holes, um, 
you're basically fishing in the dark. It's like driving a car without the headlights on. You know, it's just a, it's a guessing game pretty much. So um, a Vexlar will actually help you, or not just a Vexlar, there's lots of different brands. Um, Garmin makes them, Markham makes them, um, uh, Lorentz makes some units also. Uh, Vexlar has been around for a long, long time, uh, since the 1960s, very effective work extremely well uh, as far as an ice or as far as a fish finder goes um, so what we're going to do we're actually just going to actually demonstrate we're going to actually drill some holes i'll show you how these units operate and um, basically if you drill a hole put the fish finder in if you don't find fish you move to another spot it's as simple as that makes it a lot easier to find fish uh, you don't have to waste a lot of time on a certain spot just guessing where those fish are and the other important thing is when you're fishing sometimes these fish are suspended they might be in 10 feet of water and you're fishing 40 feet you have no idea where they are in that water column so these units help you locate at what depth they are and help you actually get your bait right to those fish and make it a lot easier to catch fish so we're going to drill a couple holes and we'll kind of demonstrate how these units work Okay, another handy thing about the Vexlars, um, right away you can actually see what your depth is. So here's the top of your water, uh, here's the depth that we're in right now. So we're in three and a half to four feet. That's a little bit shallow, so we're gonna move to another spot right now and locate some deeper water. Now that we've drilled our hole, we have the bottom, which is the red. We could actually see fish close to the bottom of the water right there. So we're on a spot where we know we can stop and actually start fishing without wasting time searching all over the lake, uh, chasing fish without actually knowing they're there or not. So the Vexlar, they make so many different units. I think Vexlar has six different units. Hummingbird has several different units. And I'll talk about some of the advantages of each one because some of the units even have map capabilities, GPS capabilities on them. So they've really come a long ways and it makes it so much easier to find and, and catch fish. So they're, uh, extremely efficient tools um, so much easier than just drilling a hole and hoping you run into some you can do it there's a cost to them you know the cheapest units are about 280 dollars so there is an investment some of the units like uh, one of the garmin pan optics that we're going to look at today that unit's about 2600 to 2800 dollars so i mean anywhere from a low end to a high end there's an investment involved but it really makes uh ice fishing a joy to find those fish and really increases your chance of success. Fish marked right here. We're going to demonstrate kind of what it looks like. You'll be able to see a little eighth ounce jig actually going down in the water. You can get it right to the fish and you can see how those fish are reacting to it. So you can see if they're coming up, if they're about to bite, it just makes the, the process so much easier. So if you haven't fished with one, I mean, it's you've got to give it a try find someone that has one or, or make that investment and it's it's well worth it in the long run. So we're just gonna drop one of the jigs right down and if you can see it, you can see his bait, which is actually starting to go down in the water column. He's getting down to the fish and we'll see if there's any reaction from him. And I know we can't see uh, the uh, flash or what it's doing there. There is some lines that are showing up, but it was one of those weird digital things where you're not able to see uh, the light that is showing on there. Uh, so we won't spend much time on this, but uh, you can you can oftentimes find very simple diagrams on this that show that 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 line going down um, and seeing your your lure. So we'll you'll see this in the next mode of technology here pretty quick. Yep, there's fish moving up towards the jig. You should have a bite shortly if they're interested in it. There we go. And it's as simple as that little, little largemouth bass right there. So without the Vexlar, we would not have been able to tell where those fish were if they were making movements on the jig either. So it, you can see how the fish are reacting to the jig and you could actually find them right in the lake in a short amount of time. So. 
that took about five minutes, a few minutes just to catch that fish. So now, like I said, there are a lot of different types, different brands, Hummingbird, Lawrence, uh, Garmin makes them, Markham makes them. This is one unit. They have six of them. And basically they just have, they all function the same. They just have more bells and whistles as you go up in price range. Um, so they have different features on them. Like this unit, this is a simple uh, FL8. Um, it basically has the transducer, that's your ice sonar. Um, and the thing you have to know is you just have to pick the right unit that's gonna be appropriate for the water that you're fishing. Like an FL8 has a 20 degree, 20 degree cone. So that cone spreads out um, in that particular pattern of shape, which is good for lakes that are 40 feet and less. If you're fishing something like Pactola that has 100 feet of water, you wanna have a cone that has a narrow angle, a nine degree cone, and that'll allow to transmit that signal further into the water without spreading it out too much so you, it doesn't weaken. So there's certain units that are gonna be more appropriate for certain depths of water. Um, some of them are gonna have split screen on the bottom where you get zoomed to the bottom six or 12 or even 18 feet. Some of the Markham units, you get actually zoomed to the middle of the water column. So if you have bluegill suspended in the water, you could actually see um, and zoom into that particular area that you're fishing. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're actually gonna demonstrate uh, one of the other units that we have to use today, and that's the Garmin Pan Optics. This is kind of the cream of the crop. There's some different ones out there, but what the Pan Optics allows you to do is actually you could put the probe in the water and you could do um, side scanning. So if there's no fish directly underneath you, you can move the, uh, the ice deucer around and you might find fish 40 feet away. You can go 40 feet away and drill a hole and be right on top of those fish. So we'll kind of demonstrate that and see how that looks like under the ice here. Now, these, there is a little bit of a learning curve with, you know, the standard flashers that we were using before, like the Vexlar, and with the pan optics. Um, so you have to play around with them a little while, make sure you figure out what settings work the best for you. Um, the beauty of a unit like this, though, is you can see actual structure. You could find trees, you could identify drop-off points very easily, so it gives you a lot more detail at the bottom. You could find weed patches and everything else. Plus, like I said, you could actually turn the unit and scan the bottom looking for fish. So they don't have to be directly under you. You can locate where they are and then drill holes looking for those fish. So it looks like possibly about 16 to 20 feet away. We may have some fish over here. Uh, let me move it to some different locations. Um, here looks like actually some vegetation, branches, trees. So it gives you a good detail of the bottom. And you could actually even tell sometimes what species of fish are down there. I was fishing oh, a couple of weeks ago and you could actually see the shape of a rainbow trout coming in and actually you could see that fish turning. So it is a live view of what you're actually seeing. And the other beautiful thing about units like these, they're also, you can use them on your boat as well. Hummingbird makes some units that can function as ice fishing units or your standard sonars on your on your boat so they're dual purpose so there's a little bit of cost to them but you can use them um, in multiple ways yeah yeah so you can see his jig actually moving up and down right now now there's a little bit of interference here there's some settings that you could change the clarity of the screen um, in jigs you just want to you want it sense enough so sensitive enough so you can see the jig but um, that looks like it's a fish probably about 20 feet away suspended over there just one off the screen so it's just a you know they are expensive but they are incredible units for for ice fishing i'm just panning the uh the unit just looking for fish in different areas see and this is what's interesting too because you could change your distance that you're viewing out so right now we're looking straight down at the screen 
you can see the jig actually right here moving up and down and currently i'm not seeing a lot of fish activity so what we're going to do we're going to move to another spot and see if we could find some some other fish so give that a try and a lot of times they'll be right on the bottom too and they're a little bit tough to see but you know if you move your jig those fish will actually start reacting to that and may come right up to the bait so okay there's the jig going down um yep you can see fish coming right to the bait right now you can see the clouds coming right off the bottom you can see how those fish are reacting they're coming right up to it um so in a second blaze should and one thing i really want to bring attention to this i know we're taking lots of screenshots of the uh, pan optics and what's going on there but i think one thing that i really learned from this is how the fish are reacting to a lure that's being dropped down in front front of them so that's why I wanted to show this, those little clouds that you see and my, that's a fish, that's a fish, that's a fish. Uh, and it's a little cloud of fish and, and John keeps talking about there being a cloud. We saw at one point a fish move in, bite a lure and we missed him. And another time moved in, bit it and up the uh, hole he went. It was really cool to see. So it's, uh, this here part, I really want you to pay attention to uh, the fact that these fish are there, or if they're not there, that they you give them a little bit of time and they're going to move on in. And if they don't move on in within 5, 10, 15 minutes, it's probably time to move on. And that's, that's what we did uh, this day on the water. Probably have a fish on if he catches one. But just an incredible tool. Oh, <laughs> did you see that fish dart right across there? Uh -uh. There's, yeah. So there's a jig. You can see the fish right on the bottom. And you'll actually, a minute ago, they just came right up to that jig. He, he just missed one there. They're reacting to it again. They're coming closer to the jig. You should have a bite in just a second. Maybe, sometimes they could be a little picky. <laughs> but the key is with these units, we know the fish are there. Um, and now it's just trying to try some different jigs and see what we can do here. That is a heavy hole too. I can't feel it, I can see it. <laughs> but that one just hammered it. And a perfect example of in the previous section, having the right rod set up instead of a $15 combo right. is going to allow you to... Yeah, we're fishing panfish here, some bass, and this is a little bit heavy rod for this type of a setup, but it still works for our demonstration purposes. We're going to try a different jig here, see if we can get into bite. So depending on the species that you're fishing, um, bluegills a lot of times will suspend in the mid column. So if you did not know that, you could be fishing off the bottom and not be aware where the fish are in the water column. So this does make it a lot easier to know what depth you should be fishing at. <laughs> but same concept with the, the uh, flasher. Yep, same concept exactly. I mean, both are gonna do the, the same thing. That gives you a little bit more detail at the bottom. The flasher basically gives you a straight down shot of your water column. So you can actually see those fish coming up to the jig and it's going to work just as effectively. Um, so the big difference, this particular unit, $280, $2,800. So there's a big investment. And there's some other units like this. Hummingbird makes one. You can get a, a Helix 5 or 7 for five, dollars $600. It's not going to be the live view. It's going to be actually a digital um, flasher like this, which with some other features, it's going to have the mapping capabilities, GPS capabilities. So there's there's so many different options. There's probably 50 different types and configurations of ice fishing units out there. So, oh, lost our bait. I'd like to bait it for you, Blake. Yeah, you. Yeah. I'm wearing gloves. <laughs> <laughs> you like my kids were younger. <laughs> I'm older than your kids. <laughs> That's the issue. And you don't want to take your gloves off to bait your hook. Yeah, exactly. 
Oh, you got a fish coming yep. immediately in there. Oh, oh, you missed it. <laughs> uh, the fish has actually moved out of the hole right here. They're actually over to the right. But most likely when I drop the jig in, it'll be enough to bring them back in. They'll notice that movement. Let's see where I am. Okay, jig is at the bottom. And I'll probably, if I just start moving us around a little bit. Whoops, where am I? Okay, those fish will probably move back. Yep, there's a fish coming towards it on the center of the screen on the bottom. So just that little bit of movement brings them right back on to right below where my jig is. Quite amazing what you can learn from fish movements and how they react to a lure. Yep, it really is. Oops, oh, I just missed them. Yeah, so they don't have to be directly underneath you um, when you're fishing. I mean, dropping that jig down is going to bring fish into the area too. I mean, they see that bait coming down, it's, it's food. I'm going to have to check my bait, see if I still have it on there in a minute. But, yep, those fish came right back in there. So, and that's the beauty of these. With the Vexlar, any type of fish sonar, you know if there's fish underneath you or not. So you're not, I mean, if you have a hand auger, you don't want to drill 20 holes around the lake trying to find fish. So this lets you drill a hole. If they're there, you fish. If not, you move on. We got to catch a fish. <laughs> yeah, we do. Okay, there's one coming up hard toward, oh, got him. That's what we were fighting. <laughs> yep, they were small fish stealing our bait, but at least we know there are fish down below and there's probably bigger ones there too. That's a trophy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get your proud angler. Yep, that's registered. a trophy right there. If you're fishing with uh, friends, you might have two or three Vexlars or uh, just fish finders in the same approximate area. Um, and they can interfere with each other. So they do have something called interference reduction at the button you push and that changes it to a different channel and that'll clear up your screen if you're interfering with someone next to you so they can be used side by side or close to each other without any problems now some of these units will actually have um, different depth capabilities so if you put on s1 you're basically fishing 0 to 20 feet if you change it to um, 2 you're actually fishing uh, 0 to 30 feet or 0 to 40 feet 0 to 80 feet it just changes the scale that you're looking at um, you can buy um, add-on units which will give you actually digital depth so you put it in there and it'll read 34 feet and you know exactly where to set the depth on the Vexlar unit a lot of the newer ones like the FLX 28 and the FLX 30 they have that digital depth built right into the unit and they, they operate automatically. So basically, if you're fishing Pactola, you put the, you know, the FLX 28 or 30 on auto, and it determines your cone angle that you need, and it gives you the depth that you're fishing. So, like I said, this is a basic unit. There's a lot more bells and whistles on some of the some of the higher priced ones, but as far as one to get started with, the FL8 or the FL12 is a great little unit. Um, it'll do everything you need pretty much for fishing in the hills except the really really deep waters oh, We got another another trophy bluegill. It's is bigger. Is, yeah, is that a green? A little green? Mm -hmm. Yep All right And we don't want to play that video <laughs> So uh, We've got a few questions that came in while we were, were chatting, and I will turn off that next YouTube video. There we go. Got it. And here I am back. Good deal. So a couple questions that came in were, uh, I know we mentioned a lot about just some clarification on hills versus other parts of the state. I'm not sure where our listeners are listening from, but a lot of the same things apply I know trout are not abundant throughout the entire state, but what Scott mentioned in the first part with the rod selection and, and having something that is sensitive enough is a pretty important thing. And we we made we proved that in the second episode or second portion where we couldn't catch those fish very well, even though they're biting because that rod was not sensitive enough on the tip. 
and it may be just a small little thing of adding one of those very cheap $2 little extra spring things that goes on the end of the, uh, the rod right here. Have one sitting right over here somewhere. Uh, but just a little extra thing there to test the sensitivity. Here's a little addition on um, make a $15 combo into a, a much better setup there. So uh, yeah, the, some of these things, same things apply throughout the state. Finding those uh, coves and the weed lines, like Scott was mentioning, all are something that's going to apply. Another question was on some of the clarification of panoramic versus a Vexlar. And I know that not many people are going to want to dish out that $2,800 for a piece of equipment to go ice fishing. Cool thing is with that one, it'd be great. I'm not a guy to go buy that either. Uh, but the cool thing about that is you could use it in the summertime too. Some of those work great on boats and kayaks as well. So you can uh, double the, the amount of times you're going to use it. But there is a lot of uh, in-between pieces of technology that you could include. Some cameras that really make fishing with kids really fun. And, and also, the, the point of using some of those pieces of technology are, are the fish there? Am I using the right thing? And I really like uh, what Scott said about we're putting it in his face there, and we can see that they're there. Okay, If they're not biting, then it's time to move on to something else. He told us afterward that he had a rod with this and a rod with a, a spoon ready to go that this didn't work. He's going on to the next thing and trying to make those fish bite. They If they're there, it just needs that little extra push to make them uh, want to bite your hook. So uh, definitely not a sales pitch for these these pieces of gear. It's showing the opportunities again, uh, what's down there to help help your, your uh, experience be a little bit more fun and maybe even more successful. So I really appreciate it as uh, someone with a science background, I really enjoyed the seeing the movement of the fish and how those fish were reacting uh, to see them hang out in there or slowly be attracted to that lure, come towards the center of the screen there and be right in the face of that lure. So it's really neat to see is that spot you're sitting at really worth sitting there for a while, or do you need to move on? So that technology, whether it's the pan optics or the Vexlar, are going to be definitely telling you those kinds of things. Another question uh, that came in was about kind of what backbone was. Scott mentioned about that. And so next time you go into the rod or in the store, test your rod before you buy it, uh, testing that stiffness backbone or the stiffness. You're going to kind of see where that rod breaks, uh, as in breaks, as in where that thing's going to uh, really start to bend. This one's pretty consistent throughout. Some of his others were bending more so on the tip uh, and so on. So check those those different things out in the store and you might be able to decipher the difference between a $120 fishing rod or the $20 fishing rod. And I think Scott really helped us all out with that and understanding what that best purchase is for us. I had a tough question come in on, you got a hundred bucks to spend, what are you spending on? Good question. And I bet you every ice fisherman is going to tell you something different. Uh, I believe Scott, I heard him on another webinar a long time ago, mentioned something about a little tool that he used to remove hooks, like a $4 item. He said it was one of his favorite tools. However, I don't have one. Uh, I'm not sure. So I can't speak too much for him. But my opinion on a couple of things as a economy ice fisherman, economic ice fisherman, very simple, don't want to spend a lot of money on it, is for me, I think the uh, there's a drill plate attachment where you can take your regular old drill. So I'm not counting the drill in the $100. Uh, you may have a drill in your shop that's a brushless drill. And uh, it needs to be brushless. As you saw in the second video, the guys were drilling holes with your regular old drill and uh, uh, that can attach to an auger. I really can't, you can't get that auger bit for a hundred bucks, uh, but you could, if you took like a hand auger, took that uh, handle off and with that plate attached to the auger bit and a drill, you've got a really good setup for 100 to 120 somewhere in there so it's not too terrible of a deal there to get into the ice because that's always an issue is people don't have augers 
and in the spot Scott was at, we drilled a hole, and that thing was that spot was two and a half feet deep or so. And especially East River on a nice cold cold uh, winter, you're going to have quite a bit of ice to, to drill through, and maybe even need an extension. Another question came, oh, sorry, uh, my other option that I would choose for $100 is now buying one decent rod. I would like to have one decent rod that's a little bit more well-rounded that you can use for multiple species, but has some good sensitivity. I would say for me, I'm a big fan of fishing for perch, maybe the occasional walleye. And walleye as well as perch sometimes have that really light bite, so I would find something with that little bit sensitive tip to the end there. Uh, the next thing I would purchase, if I had another hundred dollars, would be a set of, of some good lures. And a lot of those lures Scott had were custom made out of uh, just small, small companies. They make their little custom made lures, but those little teardrop lures, it'd be nice to have a few of those and a few of the spoons and a few of those different shaped ones so that you could try different things. And you can see his organization was was really really done well. So that's something uh, that you got three options. If you got a hundred bucks, to, to, that's where I would put my money on because uh, you're not getting a flasher for a hundred bucks. Unless you find one used and somebody uh, willing to give it up, maybe one of those FL8s could if you find one for a hundred bucks, buy it. Uh, the next thing uh, came in is how, are, how easy are flashers to use? Really would like to get one. Um, interested, but not sure uh, how that would be for a beginner. And they're not too difficult. Those they're pretty simple. The biggest thing is trying to find that right setting on the S1, 2, 3, whatever it is. Uh, if you don't have any idea how deep it is, that sometimes can be a little tricky. But you you really, if you you know it's about 20 feet or so, it's pretty easy. Then you set it to that first notch, and then. Uh, you'll be able to read that pretty simple. The best thing to do is whatever flasher you buy, go look at a YouTube video for that exact flasher and it's gonna show you exactly how to read that. We have a couple of different ones. Uh, that Vexlar that we saw, uh, there was this little Garmin one that actually was quite a bit cheaper than that Vexlar that had a screen on it um, that made more of a digital display of that flasher, but then it also had a GPS on it. and. You see a lot of GPS units in boats now, so that when you scroll over, scroll over a little, uh, a little rise or, or a little drop, and you catch the walleyes off of there, people mark that spot. You keep coming back to that spot, and you're going to keep catching walleyes as long as the walleyes are biting. So the same thing applies ice fishing. And if you can find those drop off points, you can find those those little uh, weed lines and, and differences in the contour lines. That's going to make a difference in your fishing and how much how many fish you're going to catch. So kind of nice to have that. Uh, however, you can do the same thing on your phone. There's a few very simple apps that you could get uh, or the the lake maps online to to find out where you're at and find those contours. Had another question come in that do we need to flag the hole if you drill more than one for safety? Uh, doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt at all. Uh, one of the really important things to do with uh, if you're spear fishing uh, and that's something we're going to look into next year so stay tuned till next uh, winter we're going to mess around with some spear fish and try to bring you some content on that uh, for that for sure uh, grabbing some sticks from the shore and marking your area around that big hole uh, doesn't hurt to take uh, and and maybe at least pile that snow up if there's no sticks around if you get to maybe shoreline's a long ways away maybe pile that snow up around there People obviously can, can see and notice that big pile of snow there is probably an ice hole. So um, doesn't hurt. There's no, uh, no wrong answer there. Uh, the Garmin runs, Maggie Lindsay, thank you. Uh, the Garmin runs $200 and a great fish finder. You can use summer and winter. It has a flasher option and a regular fish finder screen. So again, yeah, thanks Maggie for that. For reminding me on this, that you could hook this to your kayak uh, and uh, now you've used the you've extended your use from three four months or more uh, all the way to year-round almost to using something uh, with your small boat kayak or whatever so that would be a pretty good investment we kind of joked with Scott he mentioned that his stuff was an investment and I agree with him uh, if you're out there having fun get and enjoying the outdoors and have a good time 
then uh, um, it's, an, it, it's, it's, things are, it's good. It's good for your, your health and, and getting outside and doing things. So, uh, are there any other questions coming in here that we need to answer? Got about 15 seconds to get that in. But if not, I want to remind you of a couple of things if you weren't with us in the beginning that uh, at the outdoor campus here, we've got a lot of adult programs rolling. Uh, we've also have uh, uh, some hunt safe in person hunt safe programs we're going to be doing. I'm really looking out for groups to take on a, a hunt through a hunting 101 program. So if you have a a few people or yourself have never hunted and interested in doing that. I really want to get you your hunt safe card. I want to take you from there, give you some tips along the way. And uh, if you've never shot a deer, we'll go shoot a doe uh, and, and process it and clean it and do the whole thing. So we have that. We have some bow hunting programs co coming up. Uh, that's that's where my expertise kind of comes in with the hunting. That's why we reached out to our experts with the fishing. Because uh, that's that's not where my expertise is, uh, but we got some really great content from those guys, and uh, I learned a, a lot on that. So really want to thank you all for attending this. If you learned something, share it with uh, uh, your buddies. We'll put that on the uh, um, we'll put it on YouTube here shortly. Uh, as far as one last question, as far as in person ice fishing classes go, we're a about done unless we get a group that wants to, to go out. Uh, there's still some some opportunity. So all you got to do is get a hold of me, and, and I can take take your group. And it doesn't have to be like a school group or a church group or anything like. It can just be a, a large family. If we got uh, about eight of us, we can we can definitely get out. So you can get a hold of me at Clint. Whitley at State. Sd. Us. Uh, and I'm putting that in the chat right now. So you can get a hold of me and I can plug you in wherever you need to. And if you're over in the Sioux Falls area, I certainly can plug you in with their group uh, coordinator as well. Or if you're in the peer area, we can maybe get you uh, connected with the, the peer folks who are on this call. So thank you all again. Uh, if you, you need anything or want to take the next step in your ice fishing or outdoor adventure, we'd love to help you out with that. Take care. Thanks for listening.